Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, a program where we take a look at the writings and documents of the church. Before we get to that, I want to mention uh, three things that I'm celebrating today. One is the Feast of St. Pius X. He was born in 1835 and uh, became Pope soon after the turn of the century, I think 1903, and uh, died in 1914, just before the World War broke out. And, you know, one of the things he had said was uh, to call the nations of Europe to stand down and they wouldn't listen. And they didn't think that he had enough political sense. So they went to war and 20 million people died. You know, so that was one of his accomplishments. Another one that affects most of us today in the Catholic Church is that he changed the age of receiving First Holy Communion from 14 to 7. So that uh, he, he, and he was doing that as a way to encourage Catholics to receive more often the Blessed Sacrament. That was a very big concern of his. Also, the third thing he, he did was to, uh, uh, in dealing with uh, a group called the Modernists, uh, they were people who were trying to bring the faith. It was a movement that had really started among uh, Protestants in the 18th century. And in the late 19th, it came into uh, a lot of Catholic circles and was trying to have the faith judged by this, the norms of secular society and more rationalistic society and basically reduced the faith to good morals. And, you know, Pope Pius X was very strong uh, in his uh, explanation of things and in trying to get that changed. Also, besides the Feast of St. Pius X, today is the 63rd anniversary for me of my baptism. So that was, that was nice. But the fun didn't stop because uh, just as yesterday I remembered the 44th anniversary of my last date, uh, today I celebrate the 44th anniversary of the day I joined the Jesuits. So, <laughs> so, so it's uh, been 44 years in the society, and I thank God that my Jesuit brothers have been willing to put up with me. All right, let's take a look now at a document called Verbum Domini. Um, now, again, you can get a pa paperback copy of this document from EWTN's religious catalog. All you have to do is call 1-800-854-6316. Or you can go to EWTNreligiouscatalog.com and order it. Another way to get a copy of this is to go to our website, EWTN.com. And in the document library, you'll see it under the Faith tab. Uh, in the document library, uh, you can get a copy of Verbum Domini that is electronic copy, and that's free. You can download that electronic copy into your computer, and you can uh, uh, you know, then print it out or read from your computer as you wish. Uh, that way, keep up with this. Now, you can also watch uh, previous programs of Threshold of Hope by going again to EW10.com and click where it says EWTN Live Shows and then click on Threshold of Hope and watch earlier shows. Now, we want you to get involved and participate in this show. One, you can do like all these nice people did coming from New Mexico and Texas and Georgia and all sorts of other places and be part of our studio audience right here in Birmingham. Another one you, is you can send us your emails by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Thirdly, you can call us this, you know, during this live show. The live show is on uh, Tuesdays at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the number is 1-800-224-2222. Six zero or two zero five two seven one two nine six six. 
uh, and we'll be taking your questions in the second half of the show. All right, we're on paragraph 47, and it begins. Uh, it's uh, called Consequences for the Study of Theology. That is, the consequences of studying Scripture for theology. Now, see, a lot of folks don't always pick up on some of this, but frequently we distinguish the study of theology from Scripture study. Because in scripture study, we also have to learn a lot of languages. Uh, of course, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and then sometimes gets tossed in some Syriac and Ugaritic and a few other ancient languages, uh, sometimes Akkadian and even hieroglyphs and all that. So uh, and then you study the techniques of understanding the ancient literature, and we've talked about those methods in the past. Whereas in theology, what we tend to do is take the principles, the theological uh, statements that pull together and summarize what is found in Revelation and try to pull it together. Because you know, Scripture is not written as a systematic book. It's, it, it doesn't lay out, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas is the patron saint of theologians because he laid out theology in a very organized way. Talking about, you know, who is God, how do you know truth, who is God, uh, the church, uh, sacraments, morals, and so on. And each is in different sections of his book in an extremely orderly way of thought. The Bible isn't quite like that, but what you find is that St. Thomas used the Bible to come up with his theology, and St. Augustine did the same thing, and other theologians do the same thing. They try to, they, they go to the texts, and they'll ask those of us who do scripture study to help them understand what the text means and the original languages and background and all that. But then they will bring those ideas from it and try to put it into organized thought. That's, that's what theology does. Um, sort of like, if you think of it, um, it it's like the scripture study is like grinding your coffee beans, all right? And theology is like brewing them. All right, so you get the coffee out of it, you know, get, get something out of that. That might be a rough image. All right, so we're on paragraph 47. A further consequence of an adequate hermeneutic of faith. Now, again, we've seen that word hermeneutic many times. Pope Benedict sees that as a very important thing. Hermeneutics means the principles of interpretation. When you come to anything, you have a hermeneutic. You know, uh, we argue about that in the way we people approach the Constitution of the United States. You have a way of reading what's important and what is less important. And this is one of the things politicians argue about. You know, they, they, they get into, you know, what's your principle? for interpreting the Constitution. Well, the same thing with Scripture. You have principles for interpreting Scripture. And we've talked about those. Believing that it is the Word of God, believing that it's true, that it's rooted in history and all that, uh, these are hermeneutics. So when you have an adequate hermeneutic of faith, that is one that takes in those various elements of being able to understand Scripture, and you pull that together, you realize that, it, uh, that this hermeneutic has to do with its necessary implications for exegesis and theological formation. In other words, uh, you begin to think, how, you know, exegesis is again the way you actually interpret texts 
what you draw out from a text. Remember, I, oh, I've been going uh, uh, back and forth between two terms, eisegesis, which means you read what you want into the text. Exegesis means you draw out from the text what it actually says, whether you like it or not. Thieves don't like to do exegesis of the Ten Commandments because it tells them thou shalt not steal. But it means you don't take other people's stuff. That's very clear exegesis of the text. Eisegesis of that text would be thou shalt not steal, but it's okay for me. <laughs> that would be eisegesis. So what we want to do is exegesis, you know, and want to see what our principles of interpretation mean in order to be able to pull the meaning out of Scripture and also to form our theology. And he is especially concerned about what that means for candidates for the priesthood. So I'll give you an example. I said Jesus of a famous text we had a few weeks ago, multiplication of loaves and fish. One eisegetic interpretation was that Jesus and the apostles had hidden some bread in a cave and Jesus was standing in front of it, pulling out the loaves and the apostles were distributing it. That was by a German uh, theologian back in the late 1700s. And there was another guy who said, well, Jesus got everybody to share the bread they had hidden. Even, now see, why is that I said Jesus? Because the text doesn't say either one of those. You are reading into the text something that is not there. The text makes it very clear that Jesus Christ did a miraculous multiplication of loaves and fish. That's what the text means. But uh, it, well, the Pope wants to make sure that candidates for the priesthood are not going to learn eisegetical interpretations, reading in, you know, what, matter of fact, oh, the Bishop of Nazareth was furious. I told him about that interpretation. He said, these people don't understand us. We would never hide food from each other. Uh, what I, the eisegesis is that the scholar was reading his own selfishness into the text. That's not what it says. So that's what we want seminarians to understand, how to pull from the text good theology. Care must be taken to ensure that the study of sacred scripture is truly the soul of theology, so that what we teach theologically must be rooted in scripture. That was one of the reasons why I did my studies in the Old Testament, so that I would have my theology better rooted in Scripture. And uh, because the, the Scripture is acknowledged as the Word of God, and that that Word of God is still addressed to today's world. We still have it addressed to us in the world today. And it is still addressed to the church. We also have to hear the Word of God and apply it in our lives. And to each one of us individually, the Word of God is a challenge to each one of us, that God is speaking to us through that Word. It is all important that the criteria in number 12 of Vatican II's document, De Verbum, the Constitution on Revelation, receive important attention and that we study Vatican II uh, document on Scripture very carefully. One notion of scholarly research that will consider itself neutral with regard to Scripture should not be encouraged. Now, what's he talking about? This is a movement among some theologians who say, look, the Bible is only one more piece of ancient literature. I will treat it like I would the A Numa A Lish 
or the Epic of Gilgamesh from Babylon. Those are two ancient books. And I'll just read it like one of those ancient documents. And I won't let the Bible have any more influence on my ideas than I would the Enuma Elish. Well, I agree not to let the Enuma Elish have many uh, uh, effect on your ideas. Um, that's the story of creation, and it's all through sex and violence. Right? But the Bible is to have an impact on what we teach theologically. We are to be formed. That's the reason the church reads the Bible. At every liturgy, you cannot celebrate Holy Mass without reading the Bible. And you cannot celebrate Holy Mass by substituting some other book for the Bible. People tried that back in the early days of liturgical experimentation, bringing in Khalil Gibran and other things like that. You can't do that. The Bible itself must be a source for what we teach about God, about what it means to be human, and, uh, and, and use that. You know, I, I, I was upset a couple, few months ago that when Vice President Joe, Joseph Biden was on a television show, he was saying that he's in favor of same-sex marriage. And what he used as a way to support that was the comedy show Will and Grace. He said, well, we've all learned a lot from watching Will and Grace. Speak for yourself. I want to learn a lot from the Word of God about what marriage means. And I don't use comedies. I use scripture. And I use the catechism. That, uh, he's a layman of the Catholic Church, and he should be using the Scripture and the Catechism to help guide our society into what's right and wrong, not comedy shows that are only in reruns. So this is something that we have to, that's, that's an example of what we have to, and we can't let that way of thinking uh, you know, you know sidetrack us from Scripture. As well, we have to learn the original languages of the Bible. You know, they encourage seminarians to learn Greek and Hebrew. And if they can, Aramaic, that'd be good. But at least Greek and Hebrew. Uh, and other suitable methods of interpretation that seminarians and theologians understand the methods of interpretation. And students also need to have a deep spiritual life so that they are praying about these issues. They bring them to their own prayer life. Matter of fact, one of the things um, I did in grad school, when I read my office, the Liturgy of the Hours, I would read it in Hebrew so that Hebrew would not just be a language that was academic and something I did in school. But I wanted to understand this as a language of prayer. And it served me well, as a little side note, because the psalm that appears most frequently in the Liturgy of the Hours is Psalm 63. And sure enough, in my Hebrew comprehensive exam, I was required to translate Psalm 63. That impressed my professors. <laughs> Glad it wasn't one of the, some of the psalms that I don't read as often. <laughs> so the Pope urges that the study of the Word of God, both the tradition that's been handed on from the apostles and the written Word of God in sacred scripture, be constantly carried out in a profoundly ecclesial spirit. We read these things not in an abstract way, but inside the life of the church. That these come from the church, and they form the church, and they belong to the church. And that this study be constantly carried out um, in, uh, in its ecclesial spirit, and that academic formation 
take due account of the magisterium of the church. In other words, you know, when we read it, we also understand what the church has taught about these texts. At the councils, all the way from uh, Nicaea through the Second Vatican Council, the councils constantly quote scripture. And we should take a look at, at, at other statements of the church. Um, now, one of the things that he does, he cites here, again, Vatican II, in the document Dei Verbum, you know, the one on Revelation, paragraph 10. And he says, now, this teaching office of the magisterium is not above the Word of God. All right, that's very important. It's Catholic teaching. The magisterium is not above the Word of God, but serves it, teaching only what it has been handed on, listening to it devoutly, guarding it scrupulously, and explaining it faithfully. That's what the church does with sacred tradition and scripture. This is very important. Uh, again, I, I mentioned this on an earlier show, that uh, there I was watching a, a visit of Pope John Paul one summer when he came to the United States. And there was a, a lady who belonged to the National Organization of Women. And she was all upset. You know, that Pope, all he has to do is declare that abortion is okay, and then it won't bother people's conscience anymore. And the point that Vatican II made is that the Pope can't just willy-nilly declare anything he feels like it. He can't come down to breakfast some morning and say, you know, I feel infallible. I'm going to declare something. No, he is the servant of revelation. And he's there to protect what it actually says. Again, De Verbum, paragraph 10 continues. Sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the teaching authority of the church in accord with God's most wise design, are so linked and joined together that one cannot stand without the others. It's like a three-legged stool. You've got scripture as one leg, tradition that goes back to the apostles as a second leg, and the magisterium of the church as another leg, and that that keeps the church stable. Care must be taken that the instruction imparted knowledge that sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and magisterium are connected with each other. To keep that very clearly in mind. So it is Pope Benedict's hope that in fidelity to the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, the study of sacred scripture, which is read within the communion of the universal church, will truly be the soul of theological studies. He wants us to be at the very beginning. Again, uh, De Verbum, paragraph 24 reads, By scrutinizing in the light of faith all truth stored up in the mystery of Christ, theology is most powerfully strengthened and constantly rejuvenated by that word, the word of God. For the sacred scriptures, contain the Word of God. And since they are inspired, really, they are the Word of God. And so the study of the sacred page is, as it were, the soul of sacred theology. This is something that uh, makes us motivated to learn more Scripture as part of our formation so that the recognition of the truth of revelation will become more and more part of us. All right, let's take a break. We'll be back in just a couple minutes with questions from our studio audience and from you. Thank you.
Thank you. Welcome back. We have a really nice audience here. A, a nice, nice group. Father, I guess you brought them from uh, Deacon. Deacon uh, brought them over from Georgia. And then one of the sisters, the Dominican sister, has her family over here from uh, New Mexico. And there's somebody named Martinez uh, out there that they want to say hello to and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, right at folks from other parts of the country. And we'd love to have you come and join us too. If you can uh, be part of our audience, do let our pilgrimage department know. You can call them at 205-271-2966. Or you can also go to the website, www.ewtn.com. They'll give you all kinds of information about where you can stay and uh, scheduling of masses and programs, tours of the network, and all that. We'd love to have you uh, come here and be part of it. So, uh, in the course, place to eat. And I just had dinner over at uh, 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 the Golden Rule. And on their t-shirts, they have the Golden Rule doing to others as you would have them doing to you. Uh, so, that, so they good, good place to you know, keep the religious theme going up. Um, and it's uh, great to have you all here. Also, I just want to remind you, I am planning to lead another pilgrimage group to the Holy Land this coming December 15th. So if you are interested in going, do call 1-800-554-4556. And hopefully we'll see some of you out there. All right, let's go to a call. We have Evelyn on the line. Hello, Evelyn. Hi, Father Mills. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And where are you from? I'm calling from New York. Great. And what's your question? Oh, my question is that uh, I would like to know what part of the Bible I can find praying for the dead. I had a mass for my brother who passed away two years ago. And okay. some of my friends, they do not agree. Right. But they're not Catholic. Right, and they say right. That once you die, it's over. <laughs> well, they'll see. All right. <laughs> That's a good risk to try and take there. All right. Uh, the passage, the, well, first of all, the reason that your non Catholic friends don't know where to look in the Bible is that uh, during the time of the Reformation, Martin Luther took seven books out of the Old Testament. One of those books is 2 Maccabees. And in 2 Maccabees, it says that it is um, the, uh, uh, for, because of the belief in the resurrection of the dead. This is 2 Maccabees verse, chapter 12, verse 45, that it was a holy and pious thought to pray for those who fall asleep for the dead. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. So it's right there in Scripture, so long as you don't take seven books out of the Bible. Now, that book was still in the King James Bible when it was first published in 1611. But then, in 1627, a printing shop took those books out of the Bible, and it wasn't put into the King James Bible again. So uh, they removed those books. And by the way, Evelyn, they will try to say that we added them in. However, the reality is you cannot find a Christian copy of the Old Testament from before the Protestant Reformation that omits those books. All the Christian copies prior to the Protestant Reformation included these books. So it was part of the Bible. Uh, we did not add it in at the Council of Trent, as some of them try to say. It was, in fact, already approved at the Council of Florence in 1437 when there was a reunion with the uh, Eastern Orthodox. They agreed to it too, and it was in all the copies that we have of Christian Old Testament. 
So uh, they took it out. They don't always like to admit that, but that's the case. And we cite that and we, we use that as an important uh, part of our doctrine. All right, we have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Kennesaw, Georgia. Good to have you over here. And what's your question? Thank you, Father. Uh, my question regarding our Protestant brothers and sisters, sure. a lot of times in conversation, the topic of being saved will come up. Sure, of course. And I try to explain about justification and sanctification. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, the, a woman friend of mine, she just said, oh, I know my doctrine and I don't believe that. And it kind of stops there. So I, I, I don't know where to go with the conversation after that. Right, right. Let me make one suggestion to help your study of this. And that would be to take a look at the Council of Trent. I believe it was uh, the, the fifth session, I think it's session five, but you can look at it, it'll say uh, on justification, I think. And uh, it has the Council of Trent's uh, document, uh, no, the statement on justification. Now, it is very detailed because what the Council of Trent tries to do, and I think succeeds very nicely, is to have all of the pertinent scripture verses dealing with justification laid out. And it does what we're talking about. It starts off with the scripture. And then it tries to organize those scriptures into a coherent whole so that you can see all the different uh, parts of the uh, doctrine of justification that are mentioned in the New Testament. What usually we're dealing with in a lot of our conversations is that somebody says, well, in Romans chapter 10, it says, believe in your heart and you'll be saved. But it doesn't say, only believe in your heart and you'll be saved. All right? It doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, um, there is one verse in the Bible that mentions being justified by faith alone, but only one. And what it very importantly adds is that you are not justified by faith alone. That's what the Bible actually says. And that's, that's a starting point for the church, that we have to include all the aspects. For instance, in uh, Romans 8, it says you are saved by hope. Not by faith alone. You have to have hope. And in 1 Corinthians 13, it mentions that the greatest of these is faith, hope, and charity, but the only one that lasts is charity. So that charity supersedes faith and hope. Even though you are justified by them and saved by them, charity, love, is even greater. And that in Galatians 5, 2 or 3, it says that it is faith working itself out in love. See, Trent pulls all that together. Take some time, analyze it. They'll give all the scripture quotes. They assume that you know it, but what you can do is just go look them up and write them in yourself. That'd be a good way to get started. Does that help? Yes, sir. All right. Let's get another call here. Bob. Hello, Bob. Good afternoon, Father. How are you? I'm fine. Where are you from? I'm from Maryland, Father. Great. And what's your question? I'm reading a very provocative uh, book written in the late 19th century, Father, called 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinoquie. And he, <laughs> I, so obviously you're familiar with it. Yeah. And, and in there, he, he being a former Catholic priest uh, who left the church, makes a charge, coincidentally, that in the, in the Council of Trent, that Catholics are forbidden to read the Bible, I presume in the vernacular, he talks specifically to French, and he, and he charges that a priest then came to his house and seized the family Bible to burn it in accordance with the teachings of the, of the council. And that struck me as odd, and I wanted to get your thoughts on that and, and his subsequent charges that in the Catholic Church, of course, we're not as familiar with the Bible, nor should we study the Bible, or did we study the Bible as much as the Protestants. And I'm wondering about the historical perspective on that through the ages up until the present time. All right, hang on there a second, Bob. 
because I want to come back to you a little bit on this. First of all, I do remember for sure that it was session three of the Council of Trent uh, done in 1545, I think April of 1545, which treats scripture. And I did some work on that while I was studying in theology. And it does not say there or anywhere else that the laity or anyone else is forbidden to read the scripture in the vernacular. It's not there. You know, and again, I recommend, like I did to this gentleman, you can go to EWTN.com. Go to the Faith tab, click that. You'll see the Documents Library, click that. And look under Councils, and it's got the Council of Trent. And the documents of the Council of Trent are public information. Chinaquay assumed that his Protestant audience would not actually go read the documents of the Council of Trent. So you can go there and check it out yourself. Secondly, there is a book. It, um, I think it's called The Bible in the History of the Church. And all that it is is a collection of statements from the church about Scripture. Right? There's just all through the centuries. And I read through that, and there was no place anywhere in those texts that are official statements by the church which prohibit people from reading Scripture. So it's not in Trent, it's not in anywhere else. What you do find is repeatedly the popes tell the university professors to train priests in Greek and Hebrew, like we did today in our, our reading from Pope Benedict. He's continuing the same tradition to make sure that they go to the original languages and can interpret the scripture to the lay people. So there, there was never a prohibition. There was an encouragement to read scripture. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas was a professor of scripture before he taught systematic theology. That was his first stage of his career. Instead, what you find, Bob, go to, uh, f go find an old Catholic Bible, family, Catholic family Bible. We still have ours. We bought ours back in 1955. I remember it well. I was uh, just about six. We were living in Colorado Springs. And a Bible salesman was outside of our parish, and my mom bought a Bible. And we still have it. What you see printed there is that from Pope Leo XIII, which was an indulgence for any Catholic who read Scripture privately or as a group. In fact, there was a plenary indulgence for reading the Bible for a half hour, if you were, of course, in the state of grace. And so, I don't know how well you remember the old days, but if you wanted Catholics to do something, you gave them an indulgence, right? And reading Scripture had that indulgence. So can you start looking some of that stuff up, Bob? I sure can, Father, and I'm going to make, sure, make it a point to do so. Absolutely. There you go. Uh, so get, get to that so that uh, you don't have things. Uh, you know, he is somebody who definitely tries to pull things over people's eyes. All right. Let's take an email. Uh, Dear Father Mitch, my parents are practicing Catholics, but yet they've been drawn into the fundamentalist end times prophecies of authors such as Hal Lindsey. What can I do to help them understand that these interpretations are not accepted by the Holy Catholic Church? My son is a seminarian, and even he is unable to convince my stepfather of the fact that this is a false interpretation of scriptures. I'm concerned for their salvation, and quite frankly, I'm annoyed. Please pray for my family. Sincerely, Teresa. Well, Teresa, first of all, we will pray for your family. It's very important. Um, but I also want to mention, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm glad that they're into Hal Lindsey. 
And I would recommend that you take a look at some of his books. I think it was in Late Great Planet Earth. I read that years ago. And I read it, oh, it must have been maybe the late 70s or early 80s that I read it. And he had a prediction that Armageddon and the end of the world was coming in 1987. Dag I missed it again. <laughs> and what he did, what he did at the, uh, on uh, New Year's Eve 1987, he said, oh, I was off a year. It's 1988. Oh. New Year's Eve of uh, 1989, he had nothing more to say. It didn't happen. Now, when my Bible in the book of Deuteronomy says that when a prophet gives a prophecy and it does not happen, do not heed that prophet because he is a false prophet. Amen? Amen. And so one of the things you should remind them of is that uh, this is not a prophecy that came true. He didn't know what he was talking about. And this is why the church doesn't go into all that. You know, we, we leave that up to God. God does not expect us to know the date and time of the end of the world. As I like to say, it is not on the final exam. The Ten Commandments are. And the Sermon on the Mount is on the, is on the final exam. When you stand before Jesus, your judge. But he said that the angels don't know. If they don't know, he's telling you it's not on the exam. You just need to be ready with your moral life. That's Catholic teaching. And not to follow somebody who teaches falsely about dates and places and all that kind of thing. That's just not useful to your soul. So, so stay clear of it. Um, the other thing, too, I've had a suspicion. I read a lot of these, you know, end times books, lots of them. And what strikes me about them all is that they don't have much hope that Christians can stand firm against the secularization of our culture. They don't have a long history like we do. Catholics have a long history, and we know what it's like when Roman Empire persecutes you. We made it through, and the Roman Empire didn't. We know what it's like when the barbarians come and invade and destroy everything. We convert the barbarians and bring them to the faith and to culture. We know what it's like to put up with the French Revolution and its secularism. French Revolution passed away and Napoleon is gone, but the church continues. We know how to deal with Nazis and communists. We've gone through them all. They're gone. We keep moving along. And you, you, what we have to do then is say, look at the secular culture and look them right in the eyeball and stare them down and preach to them the gospel that we will not allow ourselves to be hoodwinked into following secular, materialistic culture, but we will present the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our task. And don't be afraid, like some of these end times people are. So that's a good thing to do. All right, we have a question from our studio audience. Who's next? Ma'am, where are you from? from Albuquerque. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Beautiful city and great New Mexican food. Yes. And what is your question? Um, I was wondering, as a Jesuit, if you all discuss amongst yourselves why St. Ignatius is not a church father or was not made a doctor of the church. So do we discuss among ourselves um, the, the, you know, why St. Ignatius was not a doctor of the church or a father of the church? Well, he couldn't be a father of the church because that only refers to the first few centuries. All right, so we weren't even trying for that. <laughs> the, um, but the, the other thing, too, is that St. Ignatius' writings, you know, um, 
were primarily the spiritual exercises and the constitutions of the Jesuits, and then a corpus of his letters that were written primarily to Jesuits. So that most of St. Ignatius' writings were to do with the interior life of the Society of Jesus, and not so much with the general life of the church. And as distinct from, say, uh, we have two doctors of the church, St. Peter Canisius, who wrote, you know, the first catechism for the Catholic Church, and who did other writings to defend the faith. Or St. Robert Bellman, also a doctor of the church, who, you know, uh, did tr even more writing than St. Peter Canisius. They had an interest for the wider church, where St. Ignatius was primarily concerned with the formation of the Jesuits. So it's, it's, that would be the main reason, okay? All right. I have another call on the line. Hello, Roland. Hi, Father Mitch. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. And where are you from? I'm from Michigan. Great. And what part? Uh, near Flint. Near Flint. I was up there a few months ago doing a wedding. Uh, I wish I had known. Yeah, but uh, what, what, what's your question? My, my question has to do with uh, the divine liturgy of the church mm -hmm. versus the way Protestants worship in their services. Mm -hmm. uh, had a, a Protestant tell me that uh, the book of Hebrews kind of says that no man is to judge how you do that. Um, and do they have any uh, kind of like uh, basis for the way they worship, or is it just kind of like, whatever feels good. Well, see, um, I, I don't know. Um, it, it's very difficult to s give a sweeping statement because Protestantism is very diverse. So that, for instance, you have some parts of the Episcopalian Anglican tradition that are very liturgical but also some parts of the Episcopalian tradition that are very low church. They themselves vary. Some parts of the Lutheran tradition are very high church, and you know they wear vestments very much like Catholic vestments, and their liturgy looks very much like the Catholic liturgy. But then you have others that belong to a more free church tradition where the focus is on the sermon primarily, and liturgical action is minimal, maybe they'll have the Lord's Supper uh, once a month, sometimes once every few months, you know, depending on the community. You know, they, they vary on that. Uh, and then some uh, do what they call traditional Protestant service, which is, you know, old-time Protestant hymns um, and uh, a sermon and so on. And others are what they call contemporary liturgy so that they'll have, you know, uh, a rock band uh, with drums and uh, keyboards and all that, and they'll be doing uh, much more lively music. So, see, you can't say that this is the Protestant answer. They're very diverse. Uh, some do try to emphasize that we go with a liturgy that feels good to our congregation especially when they have a lot of young folks. That'd be the contemporary kind of liturgies. Others will have a more charismatic approach. Others will try to keep a, a liturgical tradition, you know, so it varies. Um, so there's no one answer, but he, here's the, the thing, you know, that uh, again, our job is not to judge the consciences of various other Christians, judging somebody else's conscience is something that God does. So don't try to judge their conscience. What you can do, though, is say, you know, uh, we have this apostolic tradition that does not go back to the pastor that founded our non-denominational church, but we have a liturgy that goes back to the apostles. We can trace our bishops and our popes back to the apostles. We have those lines of tradition that, that link it, 
and that we see the liturgy not so much as an expression of what we feel, but rather an entering into what Jesus left as the liturgy in which we receive his body and blood. And that without, you know, again, we just had the reading in the Roman rite from John 6 the past few weeks. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have life within you. But if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do have eternal life. That's not a, a conciliar statement by the church. That is scripture and the words of Jesus Christ. And so that we want to call people to an understanding of the liturgy that Jesus Christ had left us and that we want to conform to what he offers rather than just what we want to do. That would be important. We have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Powder Springs, Georgia. Great. Good to have you here and welcome. And uh, my question is, in reading Genesis in the yeah. Catholic tradition, and then you get the conflicting information in science, mm -hmm. the Big Bang Theory or Darwinism, and it's hard to equate those together. Sure. All right, a couple things. First of all, I would say that the Big Bang Theory actually supports Genesis. Do you know what the Big Bang was? No, not the planets. It was, it, it was a, an outspreading of light. What does Genesis 1 verse 3 said? God said, let there be light. And so in, once, in, a, in a really amazing way, a more poetic and religious way, and a very antiquated way, a very ancient way of saying it, they're saying that everything did begin with light. And the theory of the Big Bang, which was, in fact, something discovered by a Catholic priest, a Jesuit priest, in fact, Father Lemaitre uh, from Belgium, he was, was the one who convinced Albert Einstein that the Big Bang was true. Einstein said, no, that doesn't seem to make sense. And so Lemaitre went through his formulae, because this is not just an argument about a Big Bang or something. It's, there are very concrete uh, formulae, and he proved it to him. And in fact, this is quite in line with our teaching. And so, you know, but we understand that Genesis is not a physics book, so I'm not going to go there to understand physics formulae. I am going to go to a physics class to understand that. But I can also see that the Big Bang shows that there was some point at which there was nothing, and then in another moment, a split second, there was everything. That's amazing. And then we have to say, who was powerful enough to make everything out of nothing? And then have it with certain principles. You know, when you set off a firecracker, there's not much organization out of it. You don't get any, have you ever gotten a planet out of yours? I don't think so. And so, yeah, but God also set the principles of certain constants to make that. Now, I'm going to quickly recommend you go to a website called the Magis Institute. Father Robert Spitzer, who was on my show a few weeks ago, is in charge of that. And they'll give you some of those ways to show that our love of science and understanding science is part of the Catholic Church. And it comes from within the life of the Church. And we want to push that. Okay? All right. Speaking of physics, we have run out of time. So let us, let me give you a blessing. Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we want to, again, remind you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so that we can pay all of our bills. Uh, hurting a little bit in the summertime like often happens. 
So we need your support so that this network, which is your network, can keep presenting our faith to you. God bless. Thank you.